Our speaker tonight is Jesse Frizzell, uh, talking on SCONE Secure Linux Containers with Intel SGX. Uh, Jesse is, and this is going to be a little bit long, uh, software engineer at Microsoft, contributor to Run C and Golang, served as maintainer of Docker, is the Kaiser Soze of container security, and this final one is a new addition, the patron saint of Linux on the desktop. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Yeah. So I chose this paper mostly because I know a lot about containers, but not a lot about um, hardware security or SGX. So I learned a lot by reading this and then also like looking at other papers on SGX to like prepare for this. So if there are any questions at the end, I will try to answer them. If they're on containers, I most definitely can. But if they're on the other stuff, it might be a little bit hard, just as a preface. So this paper is written by all these people people and like there's a link to it. Um, <laughs> there's like a bajillion co-authors on here. So the way that containers work today, if you aren't familiar, is they all share a kernel. Uh, so the attack surface is kind of like the kernel itself. Um, and then containers are just on top. Um, and they use you know the primitives of uh, Linux namespaces and C groups to do isolation. And then you can use like you know LSMs on top of that to actually secure them. So virtual machines look like this today. So I was just kind of trying to show that they all don't share the same kernel as um, that. And then you run containers that share the same kernels. Um, so this is kind of what the software privilege levels look like in the cloud. Um, so it goes from more privileged to less privileged. And then you have like your BIOS, obviously, at the lowest. And then uh, hypervisors and then the OS kernel, and then your application, and then like your SGX secure enclave would actually be down there in the less privileged section, just so that you can kind of get an idea of how this is all laid out. Um, and I'm going to be comparing this a lot to kind of the cloud, because the cool part about this is that uh, Microsoft actually just turned on SGX in the cloud for Azure for like uh, in alpha or beta. So uh, what would be cool is trying to then do this in the cloud, uh, which I unfortunately tried it on my own computer for a very long time, which was probably a dumb idea. So they came across a bunch of challenges in the actual design of this. Um, and there's like two things that they mainly decided to focus on as far as like trying to optimize those. So number one was keeping the code small. Um, mostly because like, if you keep your trusted computing base small, then you're going to lessen like, the risk of having a vulnerability in one of those like, libraries or whatever that you're using. It's kind of like the same thought process as if you put everything in the sandbox, then there really isn't a sandbox. Um, <laughs> it's important to keep that in mind, especially with containers too. Um, especially like side channel attacks, like if everything's in the sandbox, then there's not a sandbox at all. Um, and definitely performance was the second one that they were trying to um, optimize, uh, mostly because like an enclave thread has to copy the memory base arguments, leave the enclave uh, before executing a system call. Like you can't actually execute system calls from the enclave. Uh, you have to leave and then come back, um, which is crazy. So obviously that's going to be slower than on a native machine when you're just running it. Um, and memory pages for an enclave live in the enclave page cache. Uh, this was brought up numerous times throughout the paper. Uh, and then after a cache miss, uh, the cache lines have to be decrypted and fetched from memory. So this is where like a lot of the latency comes from um, if you miss the cache. And then you have to go back and grab it and then decrypt it. So a lot of like their performance optimizations were around this. Um, yeah. So they came up with a threat model for uh, scone in itself. Um, but I think it's important to look at also the threat model for container runtimes today. So the way it works today is if you have super user access on the computer where they're running, like it's game over with containers because obviously you have access to the container runtime and then you can just like mess with all the shit. Also, you're already on the host, so like whatever. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> definitely game over there. Uh, yeah. So the threat model for scone, it's not game over obviously, uh, which is cool. <laughs> and then also, it assumes that it, an attacker has slash can do super user access, access to the physical hard drive, and they can control the entire software stack, which is everything from you know the container engine to the kernel, which is really cool that it like handles this. Um, 
but it does not cover, obviously, like side channels. So if everything's in the secure enclave, then you're kind of fucked. Uh, and then uh, denial of service, which, I mean, that's not even a real hack, so. <laughs> so they had like a bunch of design trade-offs. And what I really liked about this paper is that they use like past knowledge and like went through kind of what they were thinking in like these previous designs. Um, because I, I'm like a huge like design proposal nerd, um, especially in open source, like design proposals are like a huge thing where you write out basically an entire paper on the feature that you're going to implement. So it's kind of cool. Uh, I love seeing other people do that. So the first one they did was a lot like the Haven paper for Microsoft. Um, and they put all this stuff inside the trusted like computing base. And so uh, this was kind of like trying to minimize the external interface uh, within like by placing like an entire Windows OS because with the Haven paper, it was mostly Windows, uh, inside the Enclave. And it exposes just like a small external interface of syscalls, which like I think they did 22 in that paper. Um, and then the library OS actually increases the size of the trusted computing base, which really sucks. Like we're trying to keep that small. That was one of their main things. Like that's pretty big in comparison. Um, and it also adds like a performance overhead due to the extra abstractions. Um, they assumed when performing I.O., uh, which makes sense. So they tried to apply the same model that was used for Windows to Linux and realized that like doing this with the Linux kernel library and uh, Musil C, like the C libs, uh, was pretty hard. Uh, and like the like Linux kernel library they were looking at had, you know, 28 syscalls which is fine and kind of comparable to Haven. Uh, but the library OS increased the size of this trusted computing base by five times. So that was kind of something that they didn't necessarily want to do. And also the servants, service latency was four times as much as if they didn't do it this way. So, um, and the applications that they were testing was Redis, uh, uh, Nginx, and Memcached. And then SQLite as well. Um, so it like reduced it, the number of untrusted OS like uh, things that could be handled directly. But they just decided that for performance, this was just not a good thing. Uh, like maybe it worked for Windows, but for Linux, this was not great. So uh, they decided that like a large trusted computing base inside the Enclave was not a good idea, and that this was just way too much. So then they went the opposite way, and they decided to make it super, super minimal, put the C library on the outside, and then have some shim C code in the actual uh, enclave. So uh, this actually raised then security concerns, because now the C library is out here. Um, and then you have to actually have the problem of protecting the confidentiality of the things being passed to the C library. Um, and it's just way harder to secure. Um, like IO syscalls, like uh, read and write, uh, could have been used to compromise the data. So um, the benefit is that obviously the trusted computing base is super small here, um, but the like lack of security is a little bit concerning when this is actually supposed to be secure. So that was their second attempt. And then the third one was kind of like this compromise where it wasn't necessarily everything in the trusted computing base, uh, but it was a uh, external interface around system calls um, with this like shielding layer, which we'll dive more into later. Um, and then you could actually shield certain syscalls, like file descriptor based IO calls, uh, read, write, receive, all those. And you can actually encrypt and decrypt the data in this uh, shielding layer, which they also did for network. Um, and then also uh, standard out and standard error. Because the thing with most applications is uh, they just assume that you can trust the host OS. So obviously, like any sort of network connections are usually in the clear. Any sort of files are in the clear. And then any sort of uh, standard out or standard air is also in the clear. So with this like shielding layer, they could actually encrypt all this um, and then know that it would uh, be secure. So, but what they couldn't do actually was certain syscalls. So fork, exec, and clone uh, do not work in this model. Fork because uh, you would actually have to 
copy the memory in a secure enclave, which is not something you can do, uh, to a new process. So that's not going to work, and then clone and exec as well. So uh, the applications that they targeted didn't necessarily use those. And then Redis, they decided like just to use it as an in-memory store for testing, which, like, I mean, if you're saving state in Redis, you're probably fucked anyways. So <laughs> yeah, uh, so system calls uh, being performed outside the Enclave are super expensive. So a lot of this was trying to make that super performant. Um, and all designs explored, you know, uh, taking this cost of executing the syscalls outside the Enclave, obviously. Um, and then uh, the, any sort of high frequency, like network activity type of application, something that's making a lot of system calls really fast is going to have like a huge performance degradation here because anything that has to send syscalls out and around uh, super fast is going to be super slow with this, which kind of sucks. So uh, they did a bunch of testing just outside of their actual implementation of this with the uh, SGX uh, library that you can use, which they didn't actually use the SGX SDK for Linux for their implementation, which I'll explain later why. But they used it for these benchmarks, which still bothers me, because I'm like, then your benchmarks are kind of different than what you did. But uh, so they just executed a bunch of pwrite calls to see what it was like with that, and then what it was like with glibc. And obviously, the like latency is less than normal, which makes sense. Like, it's not going to be as fast. Um, and most of their benchmarks were around like 60% the speed that you would usually get. So uh, memory page faults have a significant overhead. And then also L3 cache misses are like 12 times as slow. So if you're like shoving a lot of stuff into the cache that is bigger than um, the eight megabytes L3 cache, the overhead is it's going to miss it. And then it's going to be 12 times uh, for the random memory access, which really sucks. Like, that's really freaking bad. Um, and I think they even mentioned that if they had, had more time, they would have come back and tried to make this more performant, because um, I think this was probably the worst of it. So yeah, that's really bad. Uh, Although you are gaining, like, obviously, a secure place to run a container, you are, like, taking a huge hit on performance, which sucks. Um, but I feel like this could only get better through time and, like, more people playing with it, obviously. Uh, and, and they tried to, like, reduce access to Enclave memory because of this, and then also, like, uh, use the untrusted non-Enclave memory as much as possible where they could. Uh, but that would obviously compromise the security. So it's all about trade-offs, really. This entire paper is all about trade-offs. So um, this is what they ended up coming up with, which looks really, really complicated based off that one that I had showed previously. But it actually just shows more in depth what they're doing. So what they did was they didn't change the code in Docker itself. They made it so that inside the Docker container was where all the code for setting up the Enclave basically was, which is cool. And I actually super respect that, because uh, it's really cool to ship all of this in a container versus trying to push it upstream um, or anything like that. And also, then that way, it's all handled in here in this process. Um, so yeah, you have your host operating system, the container, and then the Enclave inside. And then you have your application code, and then the application-specific libraries. Those are all very typical of like how it would be normally with containers, right? So then you have these shields that they built. So the network shield actually does the encryption of like TLS, uh, which could be comparable to Stunnel. I don't know how to actually say that. Um, but it, it's kind of like that, except for they had a way better uh, performance than Stunnel, because they did some benchmarks, which I'll show for that. Uh, and then there's the file system shield, which makes sure that anything written to disk uh, or anything like that is not in the clear. Uh, then they have this NM threading, which I'll get into more in depth as well. Uh, and then they have the SGX aware C library uh, that they wrote. And then these asynchronous system calls are how they're actually passing the system call out to uh, outside of the Enclave. And then they pass it back in. So they do these with like uh, 
two different block free queues. Like there's the one for requests and then there's the one for responses. And then it calls out to this kernel module, which I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> I just hate, I hate uh, custom kernel modules and loading them on my own stuff. Uh, and then they also use the Intel SGX driver for uh, optimizing performance. But the kernel module itself um, doesn't use, obviously, the, the Intel SGX SDK. Uh, they ended up just re-implementing things. So um, yeah, these syscalls get passed in and out, uh, which is faster than, obviously, doing one at a time. They just throw it, pop it in the queue. Kernel module handles it, passes it back out. Um, which is pretty cool. It's just very complex. There's a lot of things to think about when it comes to uh, what you're doing with this, which is something that I didn't necessarily think about before reading this paper. Um, there's just a lot of things that the user actually has to handle, like the person implementing this, um, which makes it almost hard to do, like very hard to do, and very hard to do well. Um, so yeah, the NM threading model is uh, M enclave bound, uh, application threads are multiplexed across N OS threads. Um, so that's how they basically handled that. Um, yeah, so the shields prevent low level attacks, such as like uh, any sort of uh, OS kernel controlling pointers or buffer sizes uh, being changed. They also like actually check the size of the buffers going in and out uh, to make sure that there's not anything coming back in that shouldn't be coming back in to the enclave. Um, and the shields are enabled by statically linking to the application itself. So you have to like recompile this crap with like the shield library, um, which is really just interesting. Um, uh, it makes sense, but it's just kind of a pain in the ass. So uh, yeah, these all handle encryption of files, encryption of the network, and encryption of standard out and standard air. Sorry, I have a bunch of random notes. Uh, and then, yeah, the NM threading models actually cause it to have fewer of the uh, enclave transitions, which is nice, uh, because minimizing that obviously ensures that it's going to be faster and more performant. And then the maximum thread count in version one of SGX actually made you say how many threads you were going to use. But I guess then they took that out after. But like they mentioned it in the paper, and I was like, that is horrible. How would you ever know? Um, <laughs> it's absolutely horrifying. Uh, so yeah, that's really bad. Uh, but this scone, the way that they implemented it and benchmarked everything, it uses multiple threads and multiple OS threads can enter an enclave. So um, each thread actually executes the scheduler in the queue and then the, the, the schedule, what the scheduler figures out like where it's supposed to be in terms of like what, where this is call is. Um, let's see. Yeah, it does not support the fork system call because obviously that wouldn't work. I also just like don't understand how all these applications were working without the fork system call or clone, but like that's something I guess that I needed to really look into more. Um, I like most applications call clone like a shit ton of the time, so uh, yeah. So in the current SGS implementations, like you can't copy the current the enclave memory, obviously. And then the asynchronous syscalls, we went over this, okay, cool. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything that I actually really liked, because I don't want to forget. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, it does check the buffer sizes to ensure that no malicious pointers referring to like outside the enclave come back in, which is really cool. But I still think that there should be like a bit more of a check than the, than the size itself. Um, but they didn't really get into that. Uh, so let's see. Oh, and yeah. We can go to here. So overall, like Apache, Redis, uh, those were obviously slower, but memcache D was faster because when they did it with straight, uh, Stunnel and GLOC, I think this was like the most interesting part of the paper. Like Stunnel was so slow that like the actual like uh, things that they implemented in their in their shields was faster at encrypting the network than Stunnel. So it was better, which is just insane to me. Um, so it like blew my mind. But all the other ones, it's obviously exactly almost how you'd think. Like it's not as great. Um, but yeah, memcached, like nice. <laughs> so 
and memcached can utilize more CPU uh, cores with multiple threads too. So I guess they were getting like really high performance out of that. Uh, but overall, like mostly it was like 60% around here of like usual uh, native throughput. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, so the first one here, the first things, the glibc, that's just glibc was tunnel. I'm pretty sure it says that, right? And then uh, one, the second one was built with uh, Musil. Uh, I don't also don't know how to say that muscle. The small Alpine-based uh, C library. I never say these things out loud. Um, and then the third one was the small Alpine-based C library, Musil, whatever, um, but with asynchronous syscalls. So the second one was just like one at a time. So they also looked at the sizes, which I, I think this is stupid. Like if you're comparing like Musil to glibc, like obviously that's going to be way smaller. Um, but then with like their their libraries that they added, like the scone libc and then the shielded scone libc, like it adds more size. But obviously if you're going to compare that to glibc, it's still going to be less than it because glibc is such like a huge thing. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of like thought that was just like, it made sense, like it was very obvious. Uh, so, and then throughput versus latency for NGINX, these both make sense because they're not gonna get as much throughput as uh, with the others. So what does this mean for the future? Uh, since it is like turned on in Azure, um, I actually like think it would be really cool to try to do this, um, but I also, think that there is a lot that comes with this, like the complexity of passing the syscalls and then also doing all the encryption and the shields. Um, I feel like it also adds a layer of attack surface, honestly, because if there's any bugs in the stuff that you're actually putting in that enclave, like then you're screwed. And like they, they made a note of that, but like the whole thing about like uh, a sandbox not being a sandbox if everything's in it. Like, I still feel like that's a thing. Um, and they never touched on that in the paper. That's just me saying that. Um, like, there's just a lot of layers of, if there's a vulnerability in one of your C libraries or, you know, you're pulling an open SSL, you're still going to be as screwed as if, like, it wasn't inside a secure enclave, you know? Um, so I, I understand that it's preventing, like, a different series of attacks than that, but it just, like, is kind of, you know, everything's kind of not secure at the end of the day. Um, but Azure, like, is based on the Haven paper, and it uses a lot of that stuff. Uh, so it's kind of cool, like, that you can use this in the cloud now, because once one cloud provider turns something on, they all turn it on. So now it's a race to do that. Um, <laughs> it's kind of how it works, says someone who works for a cloud provider. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, like, I honestly should have tried this in Azure, but I was so focused on getting it to work on my laptop, which I could not because Skylake is such a shit show. Um, I even, like, tried, like, Intel's, like, fork of Linux with the patches that they have yet to upstream, and uh, that didn't work. I was getting all these, like, seg faults, and I finally, like, got them to give me the code, which was very, also very hard to do. Um, and yeah, it was just like such a large shit show. I should have just tried it in the cloud. Um, but yeah, that was basically what I had. Uh, I'll take any questions, I guess. Hey. Uh, the Enclave, is that a separate CPU? Is it, is it, do they use something to like segment the CPU into trusted and non-trusted? Like what is that at a hardware level? Yeah, so this is where my knowledge is not going to be as strong entirely, um, but it uses like a separate address space. Like everything is separated. Uh, there's like a whole series of diagrams based off like how SGX in itself works. Um, and I am not, well versed enough to say something and then have it repeated because I like do not know exactly. <laughs> um, ha having not read this paper, I was uh, frankly kind of shocked when I saw that they use M to N threading um, and not at all surprised that they had initially asked you to uh, 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 
explicitly uh, set the size of your thread pool. Um, I'm more uh, now very curious as to how um, they uh, maximize the thread pool, um, uh, especially considering the uh, benchmarks on um, MCached that you showed. Yeah, so um, I guess there's like another version that has that better because they just touched on the fact that version one of SGX you had to say the number of threads and then uh, I think they're just maximizing it by running them asynchronously. Um, I am not really sure. They didn't go into much depth other than that, honestly. Uh, so this sounds like it's adding like a lot of overhead to the containers just because of all the hardware stuff. What would like motivate you to use this rather than just like a virtual machine and a hypervisor? So, I mean, if you were just going to use a hypervisor, then you would have like an entirely different layout like when I first show, um, where it, like it's not sharing a kernel. Like I think that this actually gives like a level of security to containers that is not existent today. Like hypervisors have a level of security because they are already hardware you know, uh, virtualized, but like containers by themselves are not. So like taking this and then putting a container in a secure enclave where you actually make sure that nothing can actually access that process outside of what is allowed to, like that's way better than um, like this. But I'm not saying that it's better than a hypervisor itself. At an overhead of 10 to 1, wouldn't it be cheaper just to hire a sysadmin and run in your own hardware? I mean, I feel like this was more like a technical feat. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like performance in time of more people using SGX, like this is super new technology. Like the kernel, like actual upstream mainstream does not work with this yet. Like, so this is super, you know, pretty living on the edge, I guess. Um, you mentioned that you felt like um, this exposed a lot of vulnerabilities to user land potentially, and as someone unfamiliar with this, what are some examples of like something the application could do to like um, to compromise the security of this model, like that, for example, Apache or Nginx could do to yeah violate some important assumptions. Well, so if there was like an Oday and Nginx, you know, where you could grab like the SSL keys or something, um, like if it's inside this, it's still the same problem as if it's not. So, yeah, it's more like if you're on the, if you have access, like their their threat model is if you have access to the host machine. So it's not really doing any sort of side channel attacks. It's just like if you have access you will get it. Uh, and then like from here, you can't actually get in there. But if you had an Nginx O'Day, you're in there, so. Yeah, that's also like another reason why I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, how would this approach uh, compare or contrast with the unikernels? Unikernels, um, yeah, so unikernels like run it ring zero, like, uh, so, I mean, it's the same thing with the unikernel, like if you have an Nginx O'Day, you're still fucked. Um, so, yeah, and unikernels also, if you have access to the host machine, then you have access to where the unikernels are running. So uh, you're also doomed that way too. Uh, it's kind of basically the same thing as containers. Yes. Does it offer any, uh does it offer any protection if, let's say, you have your O'Day in your Nginx it, for a, con a container escape? So let's say you can get out from the containers, because I know those exist to some extent. But I mean, you need an O'Day to pop a container today. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty much the same. OK. Yeah, like you could take the containers, if you have a bunch of containers running on a host, it's going to be easier to actually try to uh, almost do something over the network to access other things on that in that network area than it is to actually pop the container itself. That's kind of along my questions lines, and maybe this is a dumb question, but something basic. What's the attack target? Uh, that they're trying to avoid? Is it the host reading data you're sending? Is it other containers accessing data inside your container? Is it um, trying to prevent 
other containers or the OS from changing the code that you're running? I'm yeah, I think really it's sure. all three of those things because uh, the thing with containers today is is like, you know, you'll have these massive clusters and then you have a bunch of things running in it and then you don't realize that like etcd can be accessed from over the network anywhere, you know, just because like someone didn't look. Uh, so, uh, or, you know, you have another container that happens to just have some like uh, IP that is also you know, somehow reachable by other containers. Um, that's kind of like the attacks that are almost the easiest in container state. Popping a container is not necessarily the easiest anymore. So um, this is really helpful for that because you can't necessarily then just hop from like neighbor to neighbor um, if there are things exposed. And then also if someone did happen to get on your host, then they couldn't also manipulate that process. It, it seems like with most, in, most encryption, it, you can't just do one end. You've got to have the other end as well, right? You can't just have like one scone process running and then it, you just tell it into it because it would be expecting everything to be encrypted on the network, right? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think like if you were to hook these things up to other things, you would then put them each in their own enclave. Uh, like, because each container would have then its own enclave, and you could communicate over the network. So, so would you need something like, uh, you know, like a secured scone secured way to access it, so you could read the uh, standard error, standard out, and all that, because it's going to be coming out encrypted. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so the way that they did it, like with uh, the network kind of encryption and like then hooking it up, like if you're exposing an IP, I think that you can still then mess with things over the network, but I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, uh, I mean, obviously you're going to have to expose an IP to use Nginx, so. Do you think that the lack of protection against side channel attacks is going to prevent uh, widespread usability of SGX, or do you think that that is something that uh, people will just deal with as a potential uh, attack vector? Um, yeah, I don't know, because like the thing with like containers and VMs or anything is everyone puts these like huge monoliths in there. And then like you have a bunch of opportunities for side channel attacks. So I, I mean I don't know how to solve the side channel attack problem, but I think like obviously like they said, keeping things super small uh, would help that. But yeah, I don't know. I, I think that like most people are gonna be more worried about the side channels than the actual um, other problems that could go wrong. But I still think it's super dope. Um, so I think a year or two ago we had Brian Cantrell talking about Solaris zones and jails and kind of a lot of the ideas that came to containers. Um, although from his point of view, doing it with the Solaris sense of like we have this, we trust the kernel not to be uh, broken into as like your base level hypervisor. Do you see that as a better approach or do you think that using kind of this hardware idea of you can put any code in here and run it as a container versus having, you know, we're just going to build a more secure operating system that you can run on any hardware. So I'm a huge fan of zones. Um, I like really love them and I used uh, smart OS for a long time. Uh, I think that zones were like what I wanted containers to be originally. Um, and even Brian knows that. So uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that zones are really nice, but honestly, at the point where we are at with containers and using like LSMs around them, you're still getting the same guarantees in that like you'd need an O-Day to pop a zone, you'd need an O-Day to pop a container, like uh, just because of the like strong sandboxing mechanisms that we're using. Um, so I think like the problem still with zones and like everything else is now side channels. I don't know. Okay, thanks.